The Science of Mind by Ernest Holmes, read by Michelle Ingalls. January 7th. There are not two minds, only two names. Mind, the thing, spirit, causation, is beyond and yet not beyond our grasp. Beyond in that it is so big, within, in that wherever we grasp at it, we are it to the extent that we grasp it. But since it is infinite, we can never encompass it. We shall never encompass God, and yet we shall always be in God and of God. Mind comes under two classifications. They are not two minds, but rather two names employed in describing states of consciousness. The objective, or conscious, and the subjective, or unconscious. We think of the conscious state as our conscious use of mind. The subconscious, or subjective, state of mind, sometimes called the unconscious state, is that part of mind which is set in motion as a creative thing by the conscious state. In the body of this textbook, under the heading of subjective mind, we say, in the subjective mind of man, we find a law obeying his word, the servant of his spirit. Suggestion has proved that the subconscious mind acts upon our thoughts. It is the mental law of our being and the creative factor within us. It is unnecessary at this point to go into all the details of the subjective mind as its mode of action. It is enough to say that within us is a mental law working out the will and purposes of our conscious thoughts. This can be no other than our individual use of that greater subjective mind, which is the seat of all mental law and action, and is the servant of the eternal spirit throughout the ages. Limitless power at man's disposal. Marvelous as the concept may be, it is nonetheless true that man has at his disposal, in what he calls a subjective mind, a power that seems to be limitless. This is because he is one with the whole on the subjective side of life. Man's thought, falling into a subjective mind, merges with the universal subjective mind and becomes the law of his life through the one great law of all life. There are not two subjective minds. There is but one subjective mind. And what we call our subjective mind is really the use we are making of the one law. Each individual maintains his identity in law through his personal use of it. And each is drawing from life what he thinks into it. To learn how to think is to learn how to live. For our thoughts go into a medium that is infinite in its ability to do and to be. Man, by thinking, can bring into his experience whatever he desires. If he thinks correctly and becomes a living embodiment of his thoughts. This is not done by holding thoughts, but by knowing the truth. Within us, then, there is a creative field, which we call the subjective mind. Around us, there is a creative field, which we call subjective. One is universal and the other is individual, but in reality, they are one. There is one mental law in the universe, and where we use it, it becomes our law because we have individualized it. It is impossible to plumb the depths of the individual mind because the individual mind is really not individual, but is individualized. Behind the individual is the universal which has no limit. In this concept alone lies the possibility of eternal and endless expansion. Everyone is universal on the subjective side of life and individual only at the point of conscious perception. The riddle is solved and we all use the creative power of the universal mind every time we use our own mind. All thought is creative. Since this is true, it follows that we cannot say that one thought is creative while another is not. We must say that all thought is creative according to the nature, impulse, emotion, and conviction behind the thought. Thought creates a mold in the subjective mind in which the idea is accepted and poured and sets power in motion in accordance with the thought. Ignorance of this excuses no one from its effects, for we are dealing with law and not with whim whimsical fancy. The conscious mind is superior to the subjective and may consciously use it. Great as the subconscious is, its tendency is set in motion by conscious thought. And in this possibility lies the path to freedom. The karmic law is not kismet. It is not fate, but cause and effect. It is a taskmaster to the unwise, a servant to the wise. The road to freedom is not mysterious. Experience has taught us that the subjective tendency of this intelligent law of creative force may be consciously be directed and definitely used. This is the greatest discovery of all time. There is no mystery here, but a profound, profound fact and a demonstrable one. The road to freedom lies not through mis mysteries or occult performances, but through the intelligent use of nature's forces and laws. The law of mind is a natural law in the spiritual world. But to what do we mean by the spiritual world? We mean the world of conscious intelligence. The subjective is a world of law and of mechanical order. In our lives, it is largely a reaction, an effect, a way. It is never a person 
though it often appears to act as though it were one. Right here, many are completely misled, mistaking subjective impulses for actual personalities. This, however, is a field of investigation not fully to be considered here. The simplest way to state the proposition is to say that we have a conscious mind that operates through a subjective field, which is creative. The conscious mind is spirit, the subjective mind is law. One is a complement of the other, and no real individuality could be expressed without a combination of both. No man has ever plumbed the depths, depths of either the conscious or the subjective life. In both directions, we reach out to infinity, and since we cannot encompass infinity, we shall always be expanding and always enlarging our capacity to know and to experience. We need not ask why these things are so. There can be no reason given as to why the truth is true. We do not create laws and principles, but discover and make use of them. Let us accept this position relative to the laws of mind and spirit and see what we can do with them rather than how we may contradict the inevitable. Our mind and spirit is our echo of the eternal thing itself. And the sooner we discover this fact, the sooner we shall be made free and happy. The universe is filled with spirit and filled with law. One reacts to the other. We are spirit and we are law. The law of our life reacts to our spiritual and material concepts and builds and rebuilds according to our beliefs and faith. Learning to trust will make us happy. All men seek some relationship to the individual mind, the oversoul, or the eternal spirit, which we call God. And all life reveals itself to whoever is receptive to it. That we are living in a spiritual universe, which includes the material or physical universe, has been a conclusion of the deepest thinkers of every age. That this spiritual universe must be one of pure intelligence and perfect life, dominated by love, by reason, and by the power to create, seems an inevitable conclusion. There is a power in the universe that honors our faith in it, there is a law in the universe which exacts the utmost farthing. We all wish to feel that the power behind everything is good, as well as creative, an eternal and changeless intelligent, in which man lives and moves and has his being. Intuitively, we sense that every man in his native state is some part or manifestation of this eternal principle, and that the entire problem of limitation, evil, suffering, and uncertainty is not God-ordained, but is the result of ignorance. It has been written that the truth shall make us free, provided we know the truth. And we note that the evolution of man's consciousness brings with it the acquisition of new powers and higher possibilities. We find ourselves torn by confusion, by conflict, by affirmation and denial, by emotion congested by fear, congealed by pride. We are afraid of the universe in which we live, suspicious of people around us, uncertain of the salvation of our own souls. All these things negatively react and cause physical disorders. Nature seems to await our comprehension of her, and since she is governed by immutable laws, the ignorance of which excuses no man from their effects, the bondage of humanity must be a result of our ignorance of the true nature of reality. The storehouse of nature may be filled with good, but this good is locked to the ignorant. The key to this door is held in the mind of intelligence, working in accordance with universal law. Through experience, man learns what is really good and satisfying, what is truly worthwhile. As his intelligence increases and his capacity to understand the subtle laws of nature grows, he will gradually be set free. As he learns the truth, the truth will automatically free him. When we learn to trust the universe, we shall be happy, prosperous, and well. We must learn to come under that divine government and accept the fact that nature's table is ever filled. Never was there a cosmic famine. The finite alone has wrought and suffered. The infinite lies stretched in smiling repose. God is always God. No matter what our emotional storm or what our objective situation may be, there is always a something hidden in the inner being that has never been violated. We may stumble, but always there is that eternal voice forever whispering within our ear, that thing which causes the eternal quest, that thing in which, for, which forever sings and sings. Divine nature is in every man. This is the thing itself. Briefly, let us recapitulate. There is that within every individual which partakes of the nature of the universal wholeness, and in so far as it operates, is God. This is the meaning of the word Emmanuel, the meaning of the word Christ. There is that within us which partakes of the nature of the divine being, and since it partakes of the nature of the divine being, we are divine. It reacts to us according to our belief in it, and it is an immutable law subject to the use of the least among us. No respecter of persons. It cannot be bound. Our soul will never change or violate its own nature. 
All the denying of it will never change it. All the affirming of it will never make it more than it is. But since it is what it is and works in the way that it works, it appears to each through his belief. It is done unto each one of us as we believe. We will say then that in spirit, man is one with God. But what the great law of the universe, but what of the great law of the universe? If we are really one with the whole, we must be one with the law of the whole, as well as one with the spirit of the whole. If we try to find something difficult to grasp, then we shall never grasp it, because we shall always think of it as being incomprehensible. The mind which we discover within us is the mind that governs, governs everything. This is the thing itself, and we should recognize its simplicity. <laughs>